can go ahead. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charles Maimela. I'm the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Law, as well as the coordinator for the relaunch of curriculum transformation. A warm welcome to you to this lecture series, which we are hosting as a university. We are taking stock of where we are with regards to the issue of curriculum transformation five years later, after the policy document on curriculum transformation was adopted by the broader university. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me first to open by wishing all the women of the UP community, as well as the broader uh, society in South Africa, Happy Women's Month, and let it be a joyous month to all the women as we commemorate the sacrifices, as well as commitments made by women in South Africa. And their available mark is still felt to this very day as they map the direction which we in the country are taking, especially in the higher education sector, where we still see the voices of women is still uh, missing, but great progress is still being made to ensure that more women representation is fully uh, attained. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado also, it's important that when we commemorate the Women's Month that we remember that if you strike a woman, you strike a rock forward with women emancipation forward. The panel members also this afternoon affirms the importance of women in the higher education space, especially in the, in, especially in the University of Pretoria, as 50% of women today who will be participating in this lecture series are women. And it's very much key when we deal with the issue of curriculum transformation, that the voices of women is fully heard, bearing in mind the history of our country with regards to women. Today, ladies and gentlemen, students and the broader community, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, to this lecture series on the relaunch of curriculum transformation under the sub-theme that curriculum transformation is not a future event but a present activity which affirms the agency of this call as well as the ongoing uh, process which this call emanates to all of us who are involved in the education sector. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are hosting three faculties, which includes the Faculty of Education, the Faculty of Humanities, as well as the Faculty of Theology and Religion. So we have a gem-packed program this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. These three faculties will be sharing with us where they are and where they are going with regards to curriculum transformation, as they will take us through what they've achieved five years later after the policy document on curriculum transformation was adopted by the broader university. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, allow me now to play the pre-recording of the Dean of the Faculty of Humanity, the Dean of the Faculty of Education, I beg your pardon, to kickstart this lecture series this afternoon and enjoy this pre-recording. Thank you. The Faculty of Education at the University of Victoria has a mind to train teachers, psychologists, and education managers for the South African basic education sector. We are very proud of the responsiveness of our academic and professional programs to deliver graduates that have been prepared to meet the demands of today head on. The faculty delivers teachers in the different phases of the schooling system that have a vision for teacher education in the country. Their training helps them to tackle their daily tasks with courage, commitment, and innovation. With growing numbers of students, the faculty is continually responding to the needs of the teaching sector. For example, in visual arts education, the way in which art is taught and disseminated has changed significantly in recent years with the adoption of online platforms. During the COVID-19 pandemic, students presented a week-long art holiday program on the Mamelodi campus for 38 pre-university academy learners from 17 schools uh, through virtual lessons and online videos. Visual art is increasingly used as an expression of human concern. And thus, we partner closely with communities in practice-led research projects. In these projects, visual art education students identify environment-specific challenges and shortcomings in and around 
a specific school community and address them by involving school learners in developing creative solutions. The Faculty of Education further offers an innovative higher certificate in sport science program. Sport is a language that everyone understands, but sport education had to undergo significant transformation to be responsive to the needs of a diverse society. The motto development module in sport incorporates indigenous games to promote an indigenous pedagogy and inclusive approach to sport education. In addition, Foundations of Recreation draws on South African and African content to consider leisure and recreation. Similarly, the sports practical module introduced a community engagement project focused on grade 10 and 11 learners who are interested in using sport as a means of building their communities and encourage university studies. The faculty embraces a progressive and flexible approaches to teaching and learning that are aimed at meeting the needs of students in a complex and uncertain world. This finds expression in our postgraduate diploma in TVET, which is currently in its second year. This program was developed and internationally benchmarked with the Department of Higher Education and Training, the GIZ, and the Technical University of Munich as partners. It addresses the strategic leadership needs of high level education managers in the TVET sector. The program makes use of innovative three-tier mentoring framework together with a flexible inquiry-based approach to teaching to develop leadership competencies in TVET college managers. This program is also industry and context specific and follows a blended approach to teaching and learning that focuses on globalization, 21st century competencies, mega trends in education and evolving technologies. These are brought together in a professional development module in which students are expected to develop a strategic plan for the college that they are managing. Such a real authentic learning experience equips students with the skills necessary to make a difference. Our curriculum prepares our students to use technology optimally in their own learning as well as in their teaching once they graduate and become teachers. For example, in design and technology, students are exposed to problems that require them to think critically through an inquiry-led teaching approach. Technology and education content requires them to design an interactive learning intervention in which they integrate technology that introduces them to 21st century skills. Of course, no discussion of curriculum transformation would be complete without reflecting on the disruption that COVID-19 pandemic introduced in teaching and learning models. Much of the transformation in the past year has focused on how to teach effectively in an online environment. The use of learning management system, the incorporation of gamified approach to learning and flipped classroom approach enabled the faculty to navigate the disruption that ensured that students still receive a quality education. Our work integrated learning has been revamped with students working in lesson study groups to collaboratively prepare lessons under the mentorship of mentor lecturer and mentor teacher. These are only some of the ways in which the Faculty of Education is constantly striving to respond to the needs of society and to deliver quality education that prepares students for the demands of the teaching profession. For example, we are busy expanding our offerings of African languages in the foundation phase so that more teachers of African languages study in the language of their choice. We are continually working hard to expand and add diversity to the content of our curriculum by ensuring students are exposed to a wide range and variety of texts rather than prescribing only one textbook. The world out there requires our students to develop excellent teaching skills and professional attitude which is borne out by expert knowledge of their subject. As a faculty, we are proud to say that we are constantly improving our teaching and committed 
to deliver not only the best students, but the kind of teacher that can function in a constantly changing national and global education context. Okay. Thank you. That was the message from the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Education, Professor Sokole. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, allow me now to introduce the two speakers representing the Faculty of Education to echo the sentiments of the Dean with regards to the issue of curriculum transformation as colleagues have had on the pre-recordings. And colleagues will be doing presentations in the interest of time and also to allow question and answer session will be very much strict with regards to time. Each speaker is dedicated eight minutes this afternoon. The first person to speak on behalf of the Faculty of Education is Professor Yohan Wasserman, who is the head of department in the Department of Humanities Education, Faculty of Education. And he will be followed by Professor Solashka Vandariar, who is the director for the Center for Diversity and Social Cohesion and is a full professor in the Department of Humanities in the, fac in the, de in the Department of Humanities Education, Faculty of Education. Colleagues, without further ado, please, you can continue with your presentation. Professor Wasserman. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Professor Maimela. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> um, rather than speak um, about the more than 150 modules that is housed in my department, I'm going to extract a single module. And I'm going to use that as a case study to try and illustrate the curriculum transformation work that's being done. And I'm going to look at the module coded JMB113, commonly known as the swimming practical module. Um, and as part of the human movement sciences specialization education um, division. Now, <clears throat> Those of you um, uh, who's a slightly older might remember uh, physical education, nowadays human movement sciences. And you might re recall at university uh, students studying that were rigidly clothed in uh, similar looking t-shirts or track shoots, track suits and always on the run. And these students, and I have a theory about that that I'll share in a moment, um, were always expected the first module was always of the physical education, not as human movement sciences um, course was always swim X number of lengths. And it was almost like a, a gatekeeping uh, module. So if you couldn't swim X number of modules, let alone a single, uh, sorry, <clears throat> lengths, let alone a single length, um, human movement sciences was not for you. And that was, um, and then and that kind of gatekeeping was very much the, the status quo as well in terms of what has happened in the humanities education and the faculty of education. So who ended up studying human movement sciences by virtue of being able to swim? Students who come from privileged homes with private swimming pools, uh, leafy suburbs with swimming pools. And you can imagine the exclusion that happened within this process. Now, Two events happened that truly challenged this. The first is what Professor Maimela has referred to earlier um, in his opening comments relates to the transformation uh, agenda of the university. And the second, of course, was the changing of the B. Ed. curriculum. Suddenly, human movement sciences could not stand on its own since 2016. And because it had to accommodate numbers of life orientation students. So large numbers of students arrived uh, for the JMB 113 module, who has firstly never seen a swimming pool in all probability in their life. They've never been inside a swimming pool. Um, for them, this was a, a, a very, very strange terrain. Now, while in the past it was straightforward and easy seemingly to say, listen, um, if you can, can't swim X number of modules, you need to do register and you have to find something else to study. Um, this became very, very problematic. Um, and um, what I'm going to try in the time that's left is trying to map out how we engage with this process. Now, um, the initial conversations were hard, lengthy, and sometimes painful, um, with 
the staff involved. Um, and, and various options were put forward. There were apparently universities that treated swimming as a mere theoretical module and no student entered the water anymore. Um, other proposals were, listen, it's not worth it. Let us kind of scrap swimming as a module completely. Um, and of course, then the old, uh, old debates of traditions and standards, et cetera, came up. So, well, if someone can't swim 20 lengths, well, what is, what is the worth of the qualification then? Um, and of course, I want to really emphasize that this was, this is not, these were not neat and simplistic uh, conversations that was multifaceted and nuanced. Um, and it meant reimagining the purpose of this module and, and the reimagining meant to think of JMB 113 as not a module to prepare people to swim at the Olympic games. These were not, um, this is not a module for, for super swimmers, but this is a module that should serve the community at large. Hence, uh, and systematically the thinking moved to away from being super swimmers, the students, to understanding water safety and to be able to be educators in water safety. Of course, tragic events like uh, that which happened at uh, Park Town Boys High, etc., gave impetus to this debate and say, well, this cannot we, we cannot continue the way that we do and exclude these large numbers of students. So um, how, do we, how do we move forward then? Or how did we move forward through the, the people that were involved in, in this process? Um, it, it, it was a multi-pronged approach which ended up with minimum standards, including you need to be able to at least swim a length of the swimming pool to meet that minimum standards. I want you for a moment to imagine uh, what it meant for staff and all those involved, and I'll elaborate that uh, on that in a moment, to get students that come from, from homes and areas that kind of historically deprived, have never had the opportunity to swim, to first enter the water and sometimes just learn to blow bubbles, just to stand in the swimming pool, maybe to let go of the side, to start treading water. Um, this is not a simple undertaking because as soon as someone entered the water, and note, we, we, <clears throat> we speak here of last year of 215 first year students that's going to go through this process. Granted, some of them were, were really good swimmers, but the large bulk of these students could not. Um, so what were the undertakings in a transformative sense that were necessary? Firstly, we need to take care of physical health and make sure that everyone, everyone is safe. So a qualified lifesaver needed to be present. Um, constantly ensure that first aid were present. Um, where do you find the support staff to support uh, to to help with students in the water? The call went out to volunteer students, students who could swim well, and large numbers of students volunteered to say, "We are happy to help students in this module to be in the water with them to help them to swim uh, and to learn to swim." So, and of course. Um, this is an intense kind of uh, rotational system to have people in the pool and out of the pool. Now, the idea was also to, it is fine to, 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 to bridge this um, divide of people who've never had the opportunity to learn to swim and to become water aware and water safe, um, but it needed to somehow culminate in something where we can celebrate this. And that was very important. So and that is where the fourth year students became involved in it meant a transformation of their curriculum. They had to organize a gala where everyone is involved, where everyone could publicly showcase their ability. Um, what happened? Most students met the minimum standards through incredible dedication of staff and students. And I'll reflect on what I call transformative moments shortly. Um, students who fell short had um, until October to prepare themselves to get another opportunity to meet the minimum standards in terms of being water safe and to be able to help themselves in, in, in the swimming pool. Um, unfortunately, there also were students who did not make it. So what were then, in a nutshell, to wrap up the transformative successes? Firstly, we managed to debunk elitist ideas about swimming and that swimming is for some and not for others and not debunk it in terms of the class only, but publicly through the gala 
and the participation of the students. Secondly, uh, it became a community of practice. Inclusion and volunteerism came up trumps with students across year groups volunteering as vol to, to help to learn, to help to get others to acquire skills that they did not have uh, before. Um, importantly, student left, students left with a deep understanding of water safety and in many cases with newly acquired swimming skills. Um, this is all good enough and fair enough, but I mean, it, it also needs to translate into what's important to the university kind of new knowledge. It birthed a research project. There's an article that came out of it that is currently under review. There's a master's student that is studying the practice of the transformation of the swimming uh, curriculum that was undertaken. Um, so a new world was opened up for so many students. Now, we can measure this success in terms of transformation, in terms of pass rates, and say, well, so many students managed to pass JM, JMB 113, but I would rather kind of um, measure it in terms of a comment made by one of the students in the student evaluation. And the student wrote, I'm now going to teach all the children in my village about water safety. Of course, with the success has come a downside. How do you manage such large numbers of students uh, in, in a 90 minute period when you have 215 students um, to work with at a swimming pool and all the challenges around that? It is nerve wracking and labor intensive for staff. Um, it is a costly exercise, but a worthy exercise. Um, and of course, this year, COVID-19 played havoc with the, the plans in, or with the, the offering of this module, sorry, with the result that we have for now moved it to the fourth quarter and hopefully by then the students will be able to return for us to have the next installment of JMB 113 and to learn from what we've done in the past and keep on transforming the swimming curriculum and other modules within the human movement sciences curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Bandria, over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Marmela. Good afternoon, everyone. My presentation today will be on a broader perspective of curriculum transformation. Transformation of the curriculum cannot be viewed in isolation. A number of other variables are at play. It is framed by the context, such as the historical, political, social, geographical, ideological, and global context, just to name a few. It is also framed by agents of curriculum delivery. And I think the uh, Professor Wasserman touched on this in terms of the community of practice and how the human agents come into play. But if we look at it in terms of academics, it's the choice of course materials, it's the language, and the mode of instruction. It is also framed by our diverse heterogeneous group of students who we need to cater to. It is framed by the institutional culture and it is linked to a paradigm of power. So the university is a microcosm of broader society and by extension of the world. So how do we transform the curriculum at UP? I see this as a twofold process. Firstly, how systems need to be transformed. And this is in terms of policies, in terms of uh, relooking, revisiting the curriculum, in terms of various initiatives. And we've seen that UP has done some of these. And secondly, it's about what individuals can do to develop their effectiveness as change agents, despite the system. So you may have a supportive system or you may not. So we're looking at agency of Human, human agents. And I think this is partly what I'm going to focus on in my presentation today. So when we talk about systemic change, we've seen, for instance, at UP, some of the policies have been addressing desegregation. And I want to again highlight the difference between desegregation and integration. Because desegregation is when you have people of diverse backgrounds and people that don't look the same like you, together in close proximity of each other. And this has largely been brought about by our democratic uh, government. Integration is where you actually interrogate the quality of contact between these diverse groups of people. And it's very much related to an issue of power. 
And I would like for us to understand this, not only in terms of physical, but in also in terms of the curriculum itself. And I'm gonna to get to that a bit later. So at the university, we've also seen um, a, the Rio Bua initiative, where we all had to attend and go and ticket off on our performance management. We've also seen largely a reaction to the Fees Must Fall protests, where academics were instructed to relook, revisit, and revise their study guides. And for me, to, this is partly a very cosmetic and superficial uh, way of addressing curriculum transformation because I can really look, revise, and, and revisit my study guide and put in all the window dressing that I think would appeal to the powers above. But what I'm actually doing in the class, nobody's measuring that. So that's one of the issues. So what we need to do, we need to look closely at representation and in terms of inclusion and exclusion. And I'd like for you to understand this in terms of the curriculum itself. We also need to interrogate power relations. It is about what we say and do, but it is also about what we do not say and do not do. And I think that is more important. So in accepting or, or um, adopting certain practices or whether it be within the department or the university itself, we've got to really look at what are we saying and doing, but what are we also not saying and not doing by implication. My focus then of the talk will be on the agents of curriculum transformation and curriculum delivery. For deep lasting and sustainable change, we need to engage with subjective realities. And this is the human agent component. Because fundamental changes in conception influences knowledge, skills, materials, context, institutional culture. So there has to be a gestalt moment. We need to negotiate the relationship between new change efforts and the subjective realities. This is the tug of war. So we can go about transforming the curriculum to meet um, the requirements that are set. But how do the subjective realities talk to that transformation? How do they negotiate it within their own core essence? So agents of change which I'm looking at in terms of the university are basically our stakeholders, but very much the academics who are the agents of curriculum delivery. They are not vacuous or open beings. They hold certain beliefs, values, and attitudes which actually make up their core essence. And these beliefs, values, and attitudes fuel their mindsets. And I'd like to believe that it is not so much about um, a lack of intention to change. It's more about how do we go about changing. So we've been in a process of colonialism, and then we move to coloniality. The fees must fall protest largely jet set at the decolonization of education agenda. But now we actually need to start engaging with decolonization of the mind, which is a rather long process, but it also needs to be addressed because then only can we have effective change. So when we talk about curriculum delivery, two and a half decades of democracy in South Africa, are institutional stakeholders ready to decolonize their minds and their ingrained belief and value systems? Are they ready to unlearn, relearn, and fundamentally transform as individuals? And are they literate about the historical injustices and diverse intellectual debates within their disciplines? So we're looking at far beyond than just changing curriculum on paper. Now, how do we go about doing this? In terms of diversity, which is basically the core for decolonization, where our clients, our, our students were demanding that they see themselves reflected in the curriculum. But when we talk about diversity, we often look at first and second order changes. So first order changes are looking at the walls of the institution, looking at its ethos of reception, looking at what posters are being put up. If I walk through the foyers, can I identify with what is in the foyers? Or am I made to feel as if I'm alienated and I do not belong? So those are the, the, the kind of first order changes that we want to see. But we need what we're looking at in terms of curriculum transformation is actually the second order changes. How do we change the curriculum so that it is inclusive, 
so that it, it reflects all the identities that are within this educational space. How do we change our assessment practices to talk to this diversity? And I believe that we cannot take a neutral stance when it comes to diversity or diverse identities. We need to embrace an inclusive institutional culture. After all, we are known throughout the world as the rainbow nation. I often use two metaphors when I talk about diversity. The first is mirrors. Where any educational space needs to have mirrors. I'm not talking about the physical mirror, but I'm talking about when a person walks into that educational space, they need to see themselves reflected because that affirms the identity. The person then says, aha, I exist. There are other people like me in the world. But then we, what is also important is the metaphor of windows. We may not have in our educational space all the identities that we want to have or, or all the identities that exist, but it is our, we are duty bound. It is our responsibility to open the window and expose our, ourselves to the other identities that are out there. And I think if we start off in the classroom to, to kind of address these issues, we, it's a good starting point for curriculum transformation. Then another thing that I talk about is equality of cultural trade. And I think this is very much what the demands were being made by the students for the fees must fall. They wanted to see equality of cultural trade. They wanted to see different knowledge systems. They wanted an inclusive knowledge system. So when we talk about equality of cultural trade, it's everybody coming to the knowledge pool and contributing to that knowledge pool and not having one knowledge system imposed on all the other role players. We also need to understand that our students come into our educational spaces with an invisible knapsack. As much as they walk in with a physical knapsack that contains their books and pens, they walk in with an invisible knapsack that con contains the entire life world. And we need to see the contents of that invisible knapsack in terms of an asset-based approach. How do I scaffold my learning in such a way that it draws on the, on, on, on the life world of my students and allows them to create bridges with the new knowledge? So our educational spaces need to be culturally compatible. It needs to take an anti-bias approach. And in this way, we can create spaces where all can feel a sense of belonging and a feeling at home. So for sustainable change, it has to be a university-wide initiative where all variables work in concert with each other. One of the ways of delivering the curriculum is what a, a theoretical framework called pedagogy of compassion. And here we're looking at how do we dismantle polarized thinking and question one's ingrained beliefs and, and value systems. We need to create opportunities where students can start beginning to think about how to um, dismantle this polarized thinking. And one of the ways is pedagogic dissonance. It's uh, shattering polite silences. It's creating an ethic of discomfort, making people question, is my truth the only truth? Because there are multiple truths. And how then we, do we go about changing these mindsets? By actually doing that, by actually creating uncomfortable moments for people to begin to question. And in this way, it's one of the ways that we can instill hope and sustainable peace. So for curriculum transformation, we should address both first and second order changes. It should reflect and affirm diverse, diverse group of peoples. It should be grounded in the lives of our students. It should be critical, multicultural, anti-racist and pro-justice. It has to address social, cultural and cognitive justice education because in South Africa, it's also about cognitive injustice. It needs to be informed by an ethic of care and compassion. It has to be participatory and experiential. And it needs to create hopeful, joyful, kind, visionary moments for people who are the end users of this curriculum. And that's our students. It also needs to instill a sense of activism and agency so that people can say, I can see there's injustice here, but what am I going to do about it? And this is why we talk about pedagogy of compassion is moving from empathy to actual compassion. What action am I going to take? And it has to be academically rigorous and culturally sensitive. So any attempt at transforming the curriculum that ignores attempts at changing mindsets will be futile and at most 
superficial and cosmetic in nature. The world agency and change in mindsets, which is made up of beliefs, values, and attitudes of institutional stakeholders is key to transforming the curriculum and the broader context within which it operates. The human agency is needed. Thank you. Thank you very much to the colleagues in the Faculty of Education for those insights. We managed to learn this afternoon the importance of uh, water safety, among other things, but most importantly, from the presentation of uh, Professor Bolmer uh, Wasserman this afternoon was the issue of swimming can be able to, to break the cultural divide which is dominating in, in South Africa and to bring the necessary social cohesion uh, among students which the faculty is, is delivering. So thank you for those insights. As well as when you look at the presentation given this afternoon by Professor Van der Rea, she spoke about the issue of power relations and that the issue of curriculum transformation does not only rest with updating our study guides, but the actual practices in our classroom is very much important. The social re uh, realities of our students, which might be subjective, as well as working with the broader community with regards to the issue of curriculum transformation is very much uh, fundamental in order to attain the necessary social justice, bearing in mind the history of our countries where we come from. For those insights, thank you very much. And colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to please remind you to put questions on the chat box for our colleagues in the Faculty of uh, Education, because now we are now moving swiftly to the next faculty, which is the Faculty of Humanities. Without any further ado, allow me now to please play the pre-recorded video of the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Africa. Thank you. Today, I'm Professor Sandy Africa from the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Pretoria. It's been more than two decades since South Africa became a constitutional democracy, and we've made some important gains in that time. But the high levels of poverty, inequality, and deep social crisis continue to show us how much more still needs to be done. Protests against poor governance and service delivery have become a regular feature of our social landscape, and universities haven't escaped this turbulence. These waves of disruption suggest that the higher education and training system does not meet the aspirations of many of our young people. The slow transformation of the sector is fueling a general impatience among parents, students, and university employees alike. High fees, inadequate accommodation, a stark digital divide between the haves and have-nots are just some of the problems we need to urgently address. Granted, we've made some progress. First, there is now more government funding for undergraduates thanks to the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. Second, some universities are now able to accommodate students in housing that is better, safer, and more affordable. Third, first-generation students are now able to access support structures in some institutions. And fourth, the number of black postgraduate students, especially females, has increased thanks to several recruitment and support initiatives. These are victories for the student movement and a sign that institutions are starting to meet their obligations to society. But there is a persistent dissatisfaction with current syllabi and the outdated models and methods used to teach them. This is why we need to ask ourselves as teachers. First, what are we teaching and is it relevant? Second, in the texts that are prescribed, whose voices matter? and whose are silenced? And third, do we equip students with the knowledge and the skills they need to impact their world? 
In the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Pretoria, we've been asking probing and provocative questions, searching for ways to encourage our staff and students to decolonize and transform our curriculum. One of the faculty's major initiatives has been to lead a super institutional collaborative project titled Unsettling Paradigms, the Decolonial Turn and Curriculum Transformation in South Africa, which is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Dean of the Faculty and Principal Investigator, Professor Vasu Reddy, explains it in the following way. Unsettling Paradigms is an intervention in the current epistemic, theoretical, and methodological struggles being articulated around the meaning of a transformed university. If to unsettle means to alter from a settled state, to cause to be no longer firmly fixed or established, then we are undoubtedly living in times where our paradigms, our assumptions, concepts, values, and practices require renewed inquiry. Whether we confine ourselves to the meaning of the word paradigm as a model or not, two questions are relevant here. What is out there? That is our being. And what exists, that is our ontology. And secondly, how do I know? How do we come to have knowledge about issues? And that is our epistemology. The Unsettling Paradigms project is stimulating reimaginative work in the humanities curriculum here at UP and with colleagues in partner institutions, including the universities of the Bidvartersrand, Cape Town, Western Cape, Rhodes, Free State, Stellenbosch, and the University of KwaZulu-Natal, UKZN. The project has the following aims. First, to promote a decolonial turn to an inclusive and democratized curriculum. The second aim is to explore untested assumptions. Third, is to stimulate and strengthen fresh insights for the humanities. Fourth, it seeks to prioritize local challenges and global South insights. And finally, the project promotes inter-epistemic dialogue and comparative analysis. The conceptual frame of this project is fourfold. We can think of the dimensions as the four R's of curriculum transformation for the humanities. The first R is for recovery. This entails recovering silenced voices and perspectives. Academics, and particularly postgraduate students involved in this project, are encouraged to recognize absences and lacunae in their fields of study. We pay specific attention, for example, to recovering the voices of marginalized and dissident writers, artists, and thinkers. The second R is for reassessment, that is, interrogating canonical figures and themes within current syllabi to assess whether they are helpful in interpreting and meaningfully engaging with the worlds they occupy. The third R is for reshaping. A transformed curriculum may well have a place for the orthodoxies of Latin studies or Freud or Jane Austen, or Machiavelli, but their places need to be redefined. An African, Global South, female, queer, dissident, and heterodox ideas, theories, texts, and creations must be reflected. Transdisciplinary collaboration is another element of reshaping the curriculum. In fact, it is necessary since the disciplinary silos that emerge in the 20th century inadequately interpret and respond to the challenges of this, the 21st century. The final and fourth R is for repositioning. The core rationale for any syllabus change should be to develop graduates who are well equipped to meaningfully contribute to the globalized world and the societies in which they live. For this reason, the key issues to consider as we seek to transform our curriculum are, 
what is relevant to students and South African institutions now, and how we can achieve such a locally relevant, yet globally recognizable curriculum. The humanities offers huge potential for curriculum transformation. In our basic social sciences and languages programs at the University of Pretoria, we are asking critical questions about what and how we teach and how we can and are reshaping our curricula. In the arts, the reconstitution of several departments, music, drama, visual arts and other entities into a school of arts has not only allowed for an invigorated and realigned curriculum for the arts, but also opened up new avenues of exploration such as tangible heritage and conservation studies that draws the dual world of arts and science, chemistry in particular, into the dialogue. At the heart of the work of several departments doing applied research and teaching, such as our social work and criminology and psychology departments, and including the Center for Alternative and Augmentative Communication and the Department of Speech Language Pathology and Audiology, are the rights and potential of the vulnerable, of people with disabilities, with communication and other challenges. And the work of our Center for Sexualities, AIDS and Gender places important question of agency, responding to gender-based violence, caring for the health needs of students, and the inclusion of all identities at the center of the academic project. In our view, to transform the curriculum means we need to understand the hidden curriculum. By the hidden curriculum, we mean that which may not be taught, but is absorbed through exposure to the spaces, symbols, policies, narratives, and embedded practices that constitute the university. It is dormant also in thinking through the questions of institutional cultures. The Faculty of Humanities is supported in its curriculum transformation agenda by its Faculty Transformation Committee. Each academic department in the faculty is represented on the committee. It provides a platform for academics to share experiences of how they drive and experiment with curriculum transformation and also makes regular contributions to the institutional agenda of the University of Issues of Institutional Culture. The 2019 launch of the Journal of Decolonizing Disciplines, led by the founding editor, a PhD student in humanities, Saseko Kamalo, is another important endeavor. An open access journal, it is dedicated to the theoretical development of decoloniality and indigeneity in higher education, thereby making a contribution to curriculum change and transformation. Now, since 2020, the disruptive impact of COVID-19 has exacerbated and further exposed our social and economic inequalities, jeopardizing teaching and learning. It's thrown up new questions, challenged us to revisit our priorities, reflect on our common humanity, and be ready in future to handle unpredictable and disruptive changes. This idea of renewal, change, and alignment to social context is unambiguously at the heart of reimagining individual and institutional change. In the humanities faculty, we fully recognize transformation as a conscious, self-reflective, and deliberate process. Curriculum transformation is not a singular event. It is ongoing, and therefore important unfinished business that we are actively and creatively embracing as a faculty. That was the message from the Faculty of Humanities. Uh, the Deputy Dean was delivering that message with the Dean of the Faculty. Thank you for those insights. And also to echo as well as support the message 
uh, of the pre-recording of the dean and the deputy dean. Um, we are also joined this afternoon by Dr. Gerald Volmerans, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Polit Political Sciences in the Faculty of Humanities, as well as Dr. Alicia Samuels, who is also a senior lecturer for the Center for Argumentative and Alternative Communication in the Faculty of Humanities. They are also here to represent the Faculty of Humanities, as well as to echo the sentiments raised in the pre-recording. Colleagues, over to you, Dr. Volmerans. Hmm. Professor Mayamela, um, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I want to present to you this afternoon a glimpse, a little glimpse into our efforts at the Department of Political Sciences in the Faculty of Humanities over the past five to six years to ensure that the curriculum we present to our students do justice to our university and national societal ideal of transformation, while at the same time also introducing students to the rigorous global disciplines of political science and international relations. Since we are so limited in time for these talks this afternoon, I want to focus on only one specific aspect of the transformation of the curriculum, namely making room for a multiplicity of voices, especially marginalized voices, and then to link this to doing justice to the other. Now, much time and effort has gone into the idea of transforming universities into so-called pluriversities, where you will find a plurality of voices coexisting with one another, especially local voices that have been historically disadvantaged, and also then to the decentering of the dominant discourses that pervade so much of academia still today. But transformation does not stop there. In fact, it only begins with this inclusionary process. For merely making space for other voices raises the complex matters of doing life, or in our case, doing politics, in the midst of this polyphony of voices. These voices cannot simply be, be presented as individual cognitive islands separated from one another, for they stand in complex and often hierarchically entrenched relations to one another. My task is thus not only to expose our students to this complex multiplicity, but also to help them navigate wisely the cognitive diversity that will and does confront them so they can act as wise citizens one day with eyes on their own individual and career success, yes, but also on the collective flourishing of our society broadly. Now, all these themes are particularly cogent to my specific academic field, namely political theory, or if you want to political philosophy, right? And also to our to my third year uh, a political theory module that I present to our finalist political science students. Now, if I turn specifically to this third year module, um, I have given it the subtitle Concepts and Conceptions. Um, for in it, I discuss a number of key concepts in politics with our students, as we should. Concepts such as freedom, equality, community, democracy, power. Now, with each of these concepts, I explore the interesting reality that people actually hold different conceptions of these concepts. We do not all mean the same thing when we use the concept equality, for example. In this module, I unpack with the students some of the prominent conceptions that have been held of these concepts, and I compare them with one another in terms of, for example, strengths and weaknesses, coherencies, and so forth. I want to give you an example of this. Let me use the concept justice, which is one of these concepts that I unpack with my students. Now, please note that within the field of political theory or normative political theory, the focus is mainly on the underlying principles and norms that informs a conception and not on, the, on its practice per se. 
Now, the various concepts of justice or, or conceptions of justice that we look at in the module includes the following. I start with ancient Egypt, Pharaonic Egypt, and we look at the idea of ma'at or cosmic justice or connective justice as it is often referred to as well. And I use this, it is interesting that this concept I use, I link it to Ubuntu for quite a number of African scholars, for example, Obenga and Diop, um, argue that Ma'at actually serves as the wellspring of all African philosophy and the seedbed of more recent conceptions such as Ubuntu. I also discuss Ubuntu then with uh, my students as a form of connective justice and particularly applying it to our local context. Uh, we look at its functioning within the TRC process, uh, uh, but also at some of the criticisms that was raised by thinkers such as uh, Wole so Soyinka, right, at its use. Also uh, look at the use of uh, uh, justice through the Gachacha court system in Rwanda as an example. But we do not stay here just on the continent. We also look at uh, uh, the platonic concept of justice as espoused in the Republic. Um, we then move also to the ancient Chinese understanding of justice within Confucianism, especially, which is very moralistic and not very punitive in nature. And we then also look at the classic conception, the Hebraic conception of justice, the Judeo-Christian conception, which is still very influential in some thinkings. And we then move to some of the big narratives of justice that pervade much of our political discourse today. The first is what I call the justice is freedom narrative, that a just society would be promoting individual freedom or a libertarian ideal, if you want to. Then there is the views of justice as fairness, um, the, the ideals that were, where there's a, an attempt to try to balance freedom and equality, right, in the writings of, for example, John Rawls. And then we bring John Rawls into conversation with Henry Odera Uruka, the father of African sage philosophy, who very pointedly commented on Rawls's arguments and actually inverted some of the lexical priorities he gave for his system or understanding of, of justice. The third big narrative we consider is that a just society would promote happiness, right? The general happiness of people, which is, which is undergirded by a utilitarian form of thinking. And then lastly, the more postmodern critical theory approach where justice is all about power, right? Where, it, uh, where justice aims to subvert the power of dominant groups in favor of the marginalized or oppressed. Now, this is just a capita selector of justice, right? For we can include a whole number of other conceptions of justice as well, but of course, one is limited in time in a module. But each of these conceptions of justice is assessed in terms of its overarching conception of society, some of its presuppositions, and value of human life, and also in terms of some of its strengths and weaknesses, for each of them has some blind spots, right? In none of them do I aim to be too prescriptive, for the aim is to teach and not to preach. In summary then, in this module, I aim to teach the students to engage with the substance of positions and not just to respond to stereotypical images or labels that might be attached to them. Understanding a position does not necessarily entail agreement with it, but endeavoring to understand lays a foundation of respect for the other that will enhance our encounters in the public space and create a true sense of belonging for all. A transformed campus to which this module tries to make a modest contribution will be one that is a deliberative space based on the respect for the humanity of all while recognizing and responding to the historicity of the moment and realities we find ourselves in. I thank you very much. And I trust that I stayed within my time limit. Thank you, Professor Monet. Thank you, Professor Monet. Thank you, Professor Monet. Thank you, Professor Monet. Uh, for those insights, now we move to Dr. Samuels 
for your insights as well from the Faculty of Humanities, please. Uh, Dr. Samuels, your microphone is off. Sorry, did you have my? Now we can hear you. Sorry about that. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Professor Namela. Um, so today I will be presenting through at looking at curriculum transformation through the lens of our Faculty of Humanities um, Transformation Committee and the role of the uh, committee in the faculty is to look at the promotion of the greater e equity, inclusivity, social justice in the faculty and to in a way provide some oversight in terms of how curriculum transformation and transformation overall um, is taking place within the faculty. Curriculum transformation is a shared responsibility with the teaching and learning commitment uh, committee in the faculty and within the transformation committee curriculum transformation is a standing item on the agenda of the committee. Okay. So um, as Professor Africa noted, the departments that are represented in the in the committee are all the uh, departments and institutions in the um, in in the faculty, as well as uh, support services. And also, importantly, we have also representations of students on the faculty committee. And because of the university, in terms of our, our commitment to uh, curriculum transformation, we have regular cu curriculum transformation dialogues where individuals from departments present or someone, a representative from the department presents on curriculum transformation efforts within the department. As a broader transformation issue, we also have transformation talks to the broader faculty as well as the institution. And so for 2020, actually, what, um, you know, it, it, as a result of the pandemic, we were, a lot of our work, we were forced to go on online. And this presented an opportunity to develop actually a digital repository or an archive of curriculum transformation within the faculty. We therefore developed a uh, ClickUp module where all the work of the transformation committee is held and where all transformation talks and where, um, you know, and recordings are, are available to members of the committee as well as to be shared within departments. And so this provides us a way to monitor themes as well as, as the evolution of curriculum transformation within the faculty and provides important case studies for representatives to share within their departments as well. And so for now, what I will do is present some um, preliminary themes that we, we see um, coming through in some of our discussions about curriculum transformation. And because we are the humanities, we, you know, we cannot separate the transformation of the curriculum from the people presenting it, the lecturers, as well as those receiving it, the students. And some of the themes which we find and which uh, Professor Vandia also um, talked about was the issue of alienation expressed by some lecturers, being lone voices at times um, in terms of those presenting uh, aspects of curriculum transformation, and also at times being lone voices in terms of, um, uh, you know, the only members of the faculty, for example, who are black or, or people of color. And also with this comes um, what members have expressed is the questioning of competence of lecturers based on identities of color, nationality, accent, etc. Um, so these are some of the, 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 the issues that we grapple with just in terms of, you know, who, who is presenting the curriculum and how that is perceived and received by those. 
within the in the uh, committee we also see really a reflection in and on action as a means to interrogate uh, interrogate the curric the curriculum and this goes beyond just the basics of changing names and colors of authors or literature but a strong commitment shown to the following for example and this was presented by mark wiggery from um, archaeology and anthropology really about interrogating the curriculum in terms of who and what is seen heard and valued in the curriculum what is taken into account with respect to race gender language geography class sexual orientation, inequality, lived experiences, and real world experiences. From a student perspective, again, this theme of alienation comes in. Students talk, have told us uh, that they do not see themselves reflected in the what and the values uh, presented in the curriculum. They also notice um, issues of discomfort with questioning issues around race and transformation and then also issues of resistance and a resistance to unchallenging unwitting eurocentric approaches but also positives we see uh, from students who report on certain modules in the faculty highlighting where students are encouraged to do critical thinking to encourage uh, issues about thinking around race representation gender norms language and also as a means of de debunking myths and stereotypes however with uh, curriculum transformation we need to think about the threats that are, are largely there as well one of the threats which I perceive is that curriculum transformation is largely left to individuals and individual modules within programs, rather than a, a full commitment within depart, in departments itself. And this could be as a result of possible non-transforming uh, of departmental cultures, which also is a trickles down from the issue of institute, institutional culture that at times I think gives mixed messages. So one of the metaphors that I like to think of in terms of uh, institutional culture is this metaphor of the iceberg, um, the iceberg of institutional culture. So above the waterline, we see all the things that uh, the, it's about the way we do things around here. Basically, the curriculum, what we do, the observable behaviors, the practices and the discourse. And below the waterline is the issues of institutional culture, which are the underlying beliefs, attitudes, values, philosophies, uh, the, the, and the taken for granted aspects of the workplace. Literally, why are we doing the things we do around here? And I give you by one example in terms of some of these mixed messages and one of the key drivers of curriculum transformation being social responsiveness. So in our department in the Center for AAC, a lot of the work that we do in terms of social responsiveness and members within this faculty, uh, I think we share a lot of these um, SDG uh, foci. So a, a large part of our work focuses on uh, no poverty, zero hunger, for example, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, reduced inequalities, as well as peace and justice. And I think these are SDGs that align with many departments in our faculty, as well as some of the other faculties represented here today. And so this really, uh, you know, focuses our work in terms of curriculum, as well as research. However, if we look at what the university sees as societal impact and this is reflected in the 2021 times higher education impact rank rankings um, that you know if you look at some of these uh, foci sdg foci we have to question is this a, 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 a the foci that is really needed for our country at this particular point in time up finds itself uh, ranked third and i know people have issues with the rankings for example but Beside the point of that, we need to ask ourselves, is this, uh, are these foci reflective of uh, a university that is really responding to the key needs of society? And I think these needs of, for example, poverty and inequality and health have become pertinent issues even more so now in the context of the pandemic, where they are even more heightened. So alternatively, what we can ask ourselves is, is the focus of the university and what it views as it values as impact is this not maybe a reflection on what the university itself um, focuses on what they feel they are good at rather than good for 
And this is the subject of an editorial that was published recently um, that looked at in, term, in, in times higher education that was presented by Julian Skirb. And he talked about, and he's from the uh, University of Manchester, which actually tops the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. And he asks himself, he asks this fact about whether, you know, we should be looking at what universities are good for, not what we are good at. And maybe not looking at the things that we market ourselves as being good at as well. So it was, uh, for me, a, a, a way forward then is to look at this issue of the elephant in the room, looking at the issue of institutional culture as something that can influence uh, the way that we actually do the things that we do at the university. Tierney talks about transforming an institution and by that curriculum requires a change of all culturally do dominant elements like shared assumptions, values, beliefs, ideologies, and meanings that people have about their organization. And so when we think about the SDGs, what our foci are, for example, I'm going to segue here into our, um, our next faculty, which is theology. And I'm going to start mixing my metaphors with uh, a parable. And so seeing the curriculum as new wine and within one of the parables says that no one puts new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the wine will burst into the skins and the wine is lost. And so too, if we see the curriculum as new wine, but still having the same ideologies reflecting neoliberal uh, principles, are we actually setting ourselves for some up for some kind of a disaster if we don't address the elephant in the room which is institutional culture. And with that, colleagues, I thank you. Thank you very much to colleagues in the Faculty of Humanities for those insights. And one thing I've also learned in your presentations this afternoon is in particular that we have to make room for the marginalized voices in our curricula, particularly as now we celebrate Women's Month, that the voices of women is, also, is very important in our curriculum to ensure that we gain that inclusive approach which we are aiming for with regards to uh, building a new curricula as well as a new uh, society post um, uh, the apartheid regime. The, the aspect which I've also heard from both faculties thus far is the importance of social uh, justice in our curricula, in our, in our delivery. And in particular, uh, Dr. Volmerans, you made a reference to the, the African value of Ubuntu, which, is, which also champions the spirit of togetherness and solidarity, which is what is very fundamental when we speak about the issue of a curriculum transformation. And most importantly, what I've gathered in your presentations with uh, uh, Dr. Samuels this afternoon is that the issue of curriculum transformation requires a concerted joint effort between all the stakeholders involved in the issue of curriculum transformation. But most importantly, what you've highlighted is the issue of collaborations between uh, dealing with is issues of institutional culture as well as curriculum transformation because we tended to deal with the two issues separately. But I had a meeting with the Director of Transformation, Ms. Nsigiu Eloteni, with the whole aim of ensuring that we harmonize as well as bring uh, these two matters together to ensure that we, we have a transformed curriculum. And I like the metaphoric which you've used, Dr. Uh, as Samuels about the issue of a new wine which we are brewing. So we need to ensure that the new wine is served with new glasses and, and new infrastructure that is in place to ensure that we take the agenda forward. Thank you for those insights. And ladies and gentlemen, you are joining us live in, in, the, in the Faculty of Law where the studios of curriculum transformations uh, sit for the 2021 academic year. Please feel free to put these chats on the, or your comments in the chat box for colleagues to be able to, to answer them because we are going to have a question and answer session right before we close this afternoon session. The two colleagues have, um, two faculties, I beg your pardon, have already presented uh, their, their views with regards to the issue of curriculum transformation. And now we are going to the last leg, which is the faculty of theology and the dean of the faculty has done a pre-recording. Without any further ado, let's have a look and listen to 
the recording of the Faculty of Theology and Religion. Hello, I'm Fale, the Dean of the Faculty of Theology and Religion. This presentation is about curriculum transformation in the Faculty of Theology and Religion, which has been an ongoing task in the faculty over its past 104-year history. Theology, like most other academic disciplines, has suffered and continues to struggle with colonial and Western influences imposed over the centuries. For a major part of its history, the faculty focused on traditional, classical, conservative, Western and Eurocentric theologies, promoting Africana nationalism and justifying apartheid. Of course, it was only inevitable with time and the establishment of a democratic state in South Africa that this would be challenged. And it was certainly challenged over the past few years. The student protest in, the 20, in 2015 and 2016 accelerated the need for change in approaches, paradigms, epistemologies, and content in teaching and learning theology. 2017, which was the centenary year of the faculty, saw the emergence of structures to relook at the when, why, how, and what we teach our students. Further, many students from diverse backgrounds also asked very serious questions about what was being taught and its relation to their current life experiences. The centenary year embraced the theme Gateway to, expressing the intention to foster inclusivity, diversity, and openness to new ideas, epistemologies, and equity. In 2018, the faculty formulated and adopted a new vision and mission statement which became the pivotal yardstick for change and transformation of the faculty at all levels, especially in the areas of teaching and learning and research. The vision and mission statement says, we facilitate life-affirming theologies by seeking to teach theologies that are constructive, critical, relevant, contextual, and engaging. Undertake quality, collaborative, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. Nurture transformative leaders that serve the academia, faith communities and society. Promote justice, peace, the integrity of creation, reconciling diversity and flourishing of all life. Create a space for pluriversal, deferring epistemologies, interreligious dialogue and new technologies. Engage critical reading of texts from religious, historical, and life experiences. This vision and mission statement has undergirded our curricular transformation, research, and postgraduate studies in the faculty. The faculty commissioned a teaching and learning audit in 2018, and a further continuation of this in 2019 and 2020. Allow me to present a summary of some of the salient points which emerged effecting transformation in the faculty's curricula. These encompass the four transformation drives directed by UP, namely responsiveness to social context, epistemological diversity, renewal of pedagogy and classroom practices, and an institutional culture of openness and critical reflection. So, what have we done to steer curriculum transformation? One, the faculty established with all stakeholders some key points of departure for transformation and change. These included a commitment to build mutual trust between all stakeholders, respect for the other, and the willingness to be transformed by the other, an engaged starting point, which speaks of where we are and how we can then work with our method and content from that position and to build a new communal identity. Two, church partners are an important part of the faculty. We have discussed with them the need to embrace inclusivity, diversity, and equality. And these values are intentionally factored into our teaching and learning content. Three, 
language has been a challenge, especially with some of our church partners relying on the use of Afrikaans. However, the faculty has adopted a language plan that encourages transformation and inclusion in accordance with the UP language policy. All first year modules are taught in English. Only church specific modules are taught in Afrikaans. There is now a greater diversity and inclusivity of students in classes. Four, all our teaching and learning is geared towards context, understanding, application, and relevance. We consciously link our material with the social context of Africa and South Africa in particular. In the different themes and topics we are, we, we are careful to include, current discussions on racism, poverty, gender, sexualities, environmental issues, church and society, and social justice issues. Five, postgraduate students are encouraged to choose topics that are relevant, contextual, and have social impact, encouraging transformation and change. Most of our research attempts to address themes outlined in Sustainable Development Goals. Six, while we have not totally discarded Western ep epistemologies, we are integrating these with African ideas, worldviews, experiences, and indigenous knowledge systems. The idea is that the African way of life should become a dominant discourse. We are conscious of our location in the global South and aspire to teach and connect with relevance especially as Christianity has shifted to the global south. Seven, we consciously give more attention to black theology, African Christian theology, liberation theology, feminist theology, womanist theology, urban theology, etc. All of these never really surfaced in the faculty prior to our democracy in South Africa. These different theologies allow for radical and critical theological engagements and developments so different from the colonial era. Eight, we have succeeded in renewing our pedagogy and classroom practices by using new teaching methodologies, which encourages inquiry, discovery, interaction, dialogue, and critical engagement. We have encouraged group work and assessments to help embrace diversity and shared learning. Nine, we have encouraged open and critical reflection, providing space for robust discussion and opportunities to learn from the other. 10, we have virtually done away with written exams and instead assess students on the basis of class participation, assignments, group work, and oral exams. We find that this is contributing to the development of a new culture of learning and reflecting on current challenges. 11, we have provided opportunities for community engagement and requested our church partners to join in these programs to steer diversity and inclusivity instead of embarking on their own programs. The church partners are in agreement and support this particular initiative. The faculty has thus advanced on this endeavor and academic programs are currently going through Senate for approval. This is starting to shape our new communal identity, although we still have far to go in this regard. 12, the faculty is consciously seeking to move from a reformed confessional faculty to an ecumenical one, embracing a variety of Christian denominations and traditions. Currently, we have more than 33 different denominations participating in the faculty. This too impacts on our teaching and learning curriculum. 13, the faculty is also working with other religions, especially in our postgraduate programs in religion studies. This undoubtedly provides for further inclusivity, which would in time have an impact on our teaching and learning curriculum as well. 14, further, we have worked on broadening, broadening the curriculum to create more opportunities for students in theology and religion to access jobs and careers not restricted to
to theology. We have provided opportunities of electives that open the doors to greater chances of employability and studies in other academic disciplines across the faculties at UP. 15, in transforming the study guides, we have done the following. We have looked at the objectives, aims, structure, and outcomes of the modules through the lens of contextuality and relevance. We realize the need to put in place semester modules within the faculty in which a discipline is taught all year through with different themes that address pertinent transformation issues. We re-looked at the duration and placement of modules. For example, there are modules taught in the final year that addresses the South African context that were moved to the first year. We anticipate a continued reshuffling of teaching themes and material to encourage relevance and contextual learning. We are working on making certain modules compulsory for all students, especially community engagement ones. We, are currently see, we currently see the divide in the choice, choices of electives between white and black students, and we are rectifying this. We have strengthened our focus in the curriculum on the different theologies mentioned earlier. We have insisted that study guides must be updated with recent scholars within the last 10 years, and they must reflect and include prominent African scholars. Study guides must cater for hybrid models, modules and take an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach where practical and possible. 16, in order to drive curriculum transformation, we have also worked on restructuring our departments to facilitate more effective coordination of themes, objectives and outcomes in teaching and learning and research. In conclusion, all of what I have shared describes some of the initiatives and endeavors undertaken by the Faculty of Theology and Religion to implement curriculum transformation. We are deeply committed to this exercise and realize that though we have accomplished much thus far, it is still work in progress. Teaching and learning is not a destination, but a journey because we are always learning. Our faculty will continue on this journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the message from the Dean of the Faculty of Theology and Religion, Professor Pillay. To support the message of the Dean, we joined this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, by Dr. Zoro Dube, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of New Testament Studies and Related Literature in the Faculty of Theology and Religion. And also we are joined by Dr. Lerato Mugwena, who is a lecturer in the Department of Religious Studies in the Faculty of Religion. Without any further ado, Dr. Dube, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, colleagues, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present my, um, um, uh, my presentation this afternoon. I'm going to quickly rush through the questions that we have focused on um, coming from the Department of New Testament and uh, related literature. The first question that we ask is, what is it that we are dealing with when we talk about the curriculum transformation? and how and where do we start and the work which we have done so far which will conclude my presentation this afternoon um curriculum transformation we have understood it as a dialectical and ongoing process of alignment of a, of the existential and the contextual needs of pedagogy which is the classroom by asking how our pedagogy or our teaching are aligning to the social development goals. 
And also secondly, we have understood it as a search for epistemological relevance that you produce patriotic and productive citizens, citizens or, or graduates. And therefore, within the new department of New Testament housed in the Faculty of Theology, we, have, we start from the understanding of the idea of who God is and the purpose of creation, which is justice, uh, universal goodness, equality of all. And the Faculty of Theology is a reflective center of this process to effect change within the community. And our church uh, partners or a church, a church uh, spaces as, as praxis, praxis spaces of doing this. And where did we start in doing this? We start with decolonizing the curriculum. And I think in most of our meetings, that was the emphasis to decolonize the curriculum. And what do we mean? It's not that we were changing everything uh, that has been done, but we're really looking into the, into the curriculum by doing a shift from the dominance of Western historical paradigm, which were textual, as my dean has, has indicated, to contextual alignment of the themes uh, with our study guides and the social development goals. Um, and how did we do this? We did this through, number one, methodological shift by emphasizing that the context is key. And therefore, in doing our research, we need to emphasize on qualitative approaches and quantitative approaches. By doing a response, as the university has required, a response to social context, and in doing this, we reflect critically on the content on the content of our syllabi by addressing the marginalized narratives within our communities and recognize indigenous knowledges and systems, but also by looking at how do we change the way we teach by using various uh, teaching methods and platforms, more uh, use of technology, inquiry-led learning, inclusivity, and diversity. <clears throat> we also um, did this through epistemological diversity by making awareness of indigenous worldviews and concepts and rethinking traditional um, disciplines, social oppression, and uh, acknowledging uh, the issue of marginalization and oppression within our community. But also, secondly, we have looked at the question of interdisciplinary approach to the way we do our studies, which is collaboration with colleagues within the same department, other faculties, and also universities across the world. And this is very important because uh, most of the time you will see uh, scholars are going abroad to find collaboration, but we have universities across us in Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, Mozambique, Kenya, and other places where such collaboration can be, can be done. Uh, so what were the problems that we have faced so far as a faculty and as a department is lack of published materials that deal with the dis discussion matters from an African perspective. And this is because of Western epistemological dominance at international conferences and a general fear from being regarded as irrelevant to the dominant Western discussions. And I think a lot of scholars uh, who go for conferences uh, abroad will see and feel this, uh, this challenge. And also balancing time between research and teaching has been one of the challenges in producing uh, published work that can be used in classes which is also aligned with the question of the politics of the publishing houses and, and the funding. And also we have realized the lack and slow of cultural pollination, as some of my colleagues have, have noted, uh, which is the institutional, uh, institutional problem. 
Uh, so what is uh, curriculum transformation uh, from what we have uh, highlighted this afternoon is that we have understood it as using as the use of contextual approaches in response to the social development goals to listen to the societal needs and to engage in a dialectical reflection that simultaneously engages interdisciplinary epistemologies and the pedagogical stance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukwena. Your input, please. Am I audible? Yes, you can hear me. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Maimela. And thank you to my dean for the foreword. And thank you to my colleague from the New Testament Department, Dr. Zoro Dube. Um, I'm from the Department of Religion Studies, Old Testament and Hebrew Scriptures. And I think one of the things I would just like to highlight um, after the extensive and comprehensive foreword by our dean and um, some of the points that my colleague Dr. Zoro Dube has raised is that coming from a department that is so diverse, um, given that the, the nature of religion studies on its own, I would just like to highlight especially the issue of epistemic inclusion. And that is because the intricacies and the inner workings of that program in terms of how we drive this uh, curriculum transformation car is, is essential is because if we do not divulge deeply into it and, and you know discuss the work that we've done so far and how far we're still going, is that we'll end up with a case of just having um, um, you know, symbolic representation without any structural adjustment in our programs. And epistemic inclusion becomes important because we know, um, we, we have learned from history that coloniality in its very nature is very compartmental. So it seeks to compartmentalize and, and, and you know, this come with this Cartesian um, um, view of things, and which is what we have sought to, to, to remedy in the Department of Religion Studies in the sense that we, we have sought to create this epistemic province uh, where all knowledge is, is regarded as equal without one discipline wanting to assume what I call the president's complex where it wants to organize everything around itself. And this is an, a very important program and a, a, a disruptive one as well in a good way because it completely alters our world as we know it. And in, in seeking to organize, it also does so much undoing and which is necessary. And also to note how the process of undoing is not a romantic process um, because eventually things have to fall apart to come together. And if that's not the case, if we do not all participate in this epistemic province, um, we, we find ourselves now producing students in the classroom who become what um, just gain knowledge in what Fred Morton calls the, the fugitive enlightenment, uh, fugitive knowledge, 
where they just become passive participants in the classroom. And then when they leave, now they go into what we call the undercommons of the university. And that's where they become more active and become subservient um, intellectuals. And so we seek to remedy that and to iron out that contradiction by introducing this province of ideas within the classroom, where we don't just produce fugitives of knowledge and fugitives of enlightenment. And religious studies has done that extensively well, um, given that our faculty for a long time was just the faculty of theology. And it's only recently we became the faculty of theology and religion. And so that also signals um, the work that has been put in into wanting to create this, this province of states um, where everyone can participate equally. And um, another thing is that in, in recognizing other forms of knowledge, in the Department of Religion, uh, we don't only seek just to extract the dramatic impact of, of other forms of knowledge. Um, we, we want to recognize them and acknowledge them in their completeness. Um, that is given their cultural patterns, academic value, social impact, authority, and most important, epistemic validity. And as we learn from, from the renowned scholar Franz Fanon that this change is extraordinarily important uh, because it is desired, it is clamored for and demanded. And coming from a faculty and given the, the department that I'm also in, coming from a faculty, as our dean has alluded to, coming from a faculty where one of the many tools that have been used as a catalyst to, to structure and to uphold the social cultural identity, which is Afrikanerdom, has been language. We Okay. Yes, you can please speak up, uh, Dr. Mugwena. Okay, I think Dr. Mugwena is reconnecting. Apologies, colleagues, for, for, for the inconvenience. Let's allow Dr. Mugwena to just come back. That was my connectivity. Um, I think I was cut off while I was just wrapping up to say that um, we, we also recognize all, all the, 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 the studies and the work that we do. Um, and this is why we refuse also to, to call these, the, these uh, the works that have been done as marginal or recovery studies, but we recognize them as equal participants in the, in the, in the, in the market of ideas. And just to wrap up and to quote from the African uh, Argentinian um, Black Liberation theologian, uh, Gustavo Guterres, he says that although there's still a long road ahead, um, positions are being taken which are no longer so ambiguous or naive. There's a new attitude, different uh, society, and basically new forms of, of knowledge and the church's presence in it. And I think that's what the, uh, has been done, the work that we've been doing so far in the in the Department of Religion Studies. And I will stop it there. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much, colleagues, uh, Faculty of Theology and Religion Studies for your insights with regards to uh, the, the topic on the relaunch, as well as to get, take us through paces as to what you have been doing in the faculty and what you are aiming to do going forward. But most importantly, from what I gather from both Dr. Dube as well as Mukwena, is important that, as they highlight in their presentations, that context is very important. Why do we do curriculum transformation, among other things? And also, the, the issue of curriculum transformation or change in general is not something that is easy. It's a difficult process because uh, as human beings, there's a fear of the unknown, among other things. 
and uh, it's important that in this drive, as they've highlighted the two colleagues, that we need to be inclusive and also the students who are the recipients of the knowledge which we are teaching, that they should not be fugitive of knowledge, but we are in actual fact in the process of ensuring that our students become proactive among other things with the whole aim that we are to give uh, or produce graduates who are able to stand on their ground among other things when it comes to knowledge production as well as knowledge generations. So colleagues, thank you very much as well from the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies. Colleagues, we have 15 minutes straight for question and answer session uh, to ensure that we are able to get uh, insights or from the panel members of uh, this afternoon from the three uh, faculties. So colleagues at home, please feel free to populate questions on the chat box to ensure that the panel members are able to answer within the allocated time of 15 minutes. Without any further ado, allow me now to pose a question by Professor Sandy Africa to Professor Wasserman, where Professor Africa is, is asking uh, you, Professor uh, Wasserman, that you give an example of the changing uh, changes the swimming curriculum. Uh, I beg your pardon. The Professor Sandy Africa is saying that the example of changing the swimming curricula is so interesting. Can you share a few more highlights of what's changed in the human movement curricula at senior levels? Um, <clears throat> thank you for that question, Professor Africa. Yes, uh, in many ways, there's still a long way to go. <clears throat> um, one of the challenges we've re within this, to a certain extent, almost archaic curriculum is, is gymnastics. So gymnastics comes later in, in the course. And of course, firstly, it's in, in incredibly uh, expensive um, um, module to run, um, but also, again, incredibly exclusive because it speaks to kind of students that has many a time certain ability, certain body shapes, etc. So we, <clears throat> we are moving towards thinking about um, much uh, modules that are much more mass participation. Um, and uh, including in this is um, indigenous games. And we've had some real success with, with uh, indigenous games within the department in, in the senior modules. Um, dance um, has, has, has made its way into the curriculum. So we, we, we are challenging uh, systematically, um, and I mean systematically because, again, as I've said during my presentation, this is, and, 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 and colleagues have echoed that this is um, a long-term uh, um, process. So we, we are challenging some of the, um, the aspects of the curriculum as it existed kind of almost untouched for, for, for many, many years. And I think we are, we are making, making inroads in terms of transforming that to serve society and our students at, uh, at a broader level. Thank you very much for that response, uh, Professor Fasserman. We also had a question from Tandolwe Tutlanga, who directed the question to Dr. Volmerans, as well as the Deputy Dean, Professor Africa, with regards to the issue of admission of students in postgraduate level. Uh, I see Professor Africa has provided a response to that effect. I don't know if uh, Dr. Volmerans, you want to add with regards to the response provided by the Deputy Dean to that effect. Dr. Volmerans, are you still with us? Okay. But I see um, Professor Africa as well as Tandolue too is very satisfied with the answer provided to that effect. And we move to the next question, colleagues. Uh, the next question is from Vicky Graham, and Vicky is asking, Dr. Dube, 
But Dean mentioned the point about almost doing away completely with written exams. If I had cut correctly and bringing in participation marks, orals and group work, I wondered if you had any student feedback on this change and if students have reported enjoying this change. Dr. Dube, your insights, please. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Prof. Maimela. Um, I, I think I think what the dean has alluded to is is that we need multi modal ways of assessment. The traditional way of assessment is normally to to allocate perhaps eighty percent of uh, the whole module to exams. And therefore, that, that puts pressure on students to cram and just sit in the exam room and forget about, about the rest. It does not give room for reflection and, and also discussion. So we need to now to start to think about um, what are the knowledge retention systems or modes of assessment that we can use without, um, I mean, without allocating the bulk of the percentage to, to exams. So I think that is what I said. Regarding students, I think the challenge that we have right now is mostly plagiarism and the students are more clever these days. They use a number of softwares to hide away from, um, uh, from, uh, from, from being caught. So that is one of the challenges that we have in using only the assessment through ass assignments or other things. But that is the, uh, the direction that the faculty is taking to use different forms of assessment, uh, assignments and others to, to, to get a better um, knowledge retention from for our students. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Is back. Thank you very much for those insights, Dr. Dube. Professor Dr. Valmorans, are you able now to um, speak on your mic? There we go. I am. I am. Uh, I am. Thank you very much. Yes, I dropped off there for a moment, and when I came back, I didn't have a mic anymore. <laughs> um, my, my quick response is: um, I can. Uh, I saw uh, Prof. Africa already address this, and I concur fully with what she said. Just a, a, a bit of information: there's actually not such a great disparity at a postgraduate level between political science and international relations. We have exactly the same number of PhDs. We have 20 political science PhDs and 20 international relations PhDs in the 2021 year. If we look at the, the master's level, there appears to be a bit of a, a, a dis, disparity, but as Prof. Africa uh, mentioned, one of the reasons is because there's not a coursework master's available in political science, and that is in the process of being reactivated. And we but, but, but even despite that, there's, there, there's not a, a significant imbalance in the number. There it has been in the past two years some uh, imbalance in terms of a preference for international relations at honours level. But if we go back a bit further, we'll see that there were times when the political science were more preferred than the international relations, right? So um, uh, I trust that adds a bit of context also to, to what you mentioned. Thank you very much, Prof. Maimel. Thank you very much. Uh, again, um, thank you very much. There's also a question again from Goya directed to uh, Professor Wasserman, and it's saying, I see FINA is increasing its investment in African swimming and has identified two South African universities for elite training bases. Can you confirm if UP uh, is one of these two? Um, uh, Professor Maimela, no, I, I, I've just read it as well. I have not, uh, beyond what I've read, uh, I've, I've, um, I, know, I don't know. Thank you very much for, for that. There's one question I wanted to, to, to probe in particular to Dr. Mukwena. You, you spoke about the issue of um, we, we, we should not be in the process of producing uh, 
our students to become fugitive of knowledge, among other things. But a proactive stance should be the one which we adopt, bearing in mind the power imbalances in our classes. My question to you, very brief, is why is it still a, a thorny issue to speak about curriculum transformation post-democracy in South Africa due to uh, the, the advances which we have made as a country thus far? Why don't we, in a nutshell, embrace the, the, this exercise of curriculum transformation and do it as a, a collective? Um, thank you for that question, Chairperson. Um, my answer to that, I think I will just want to reiterate the, in, in answering the question, to reiterate the words of Professor Fred Morton when he says that we should, by asking that question, we need to interrogate the role of the university. And it has become common that the university has become a place of refugee. But at the same time, the university has no longer become a place of enlightenment. And this is why it produces uh, fugitives of knowledge. And this is why the most subservient intellectuals are found in what he calls the undercommons. The, they, they find pleasure in the hold. And it is important to, to interrogate that stance. And because now, if we continue to produce fugitives, then we are going to produce uh, 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 scholars who just come to the university, in his words, just to spite its mission, to continue to steal from it and to abuse its hospitality. So we need to be able to be in a position where we no longer, like I said, for me, I take highly given that I also teach uh, Hebrew. So I understand the importance of language and how we fashion and you know how we how we interrogate with this grammar. And so when we continue to say that we are in a position where we are including, we are excluding, we are that language becomes a stronghold. And as a result, we need to come to a place where we say we are just having conversations. They shouldn't be characterized as as as, as uncomfortable. There's nothing uncomfortable about uh, wanting to include. Like I said, the process of decolonization is not a romantic one. And if we adopt that stance from the beginning, then we have a way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukwen. While you are at it, can you please provide us with your closing remarks, please? My closing remarks at this point is to say that um, the university, the faculties, the departments should no longer be a place where we just come to be spectators endorsing um, um, policies, uh, agendas that we are not aware of. And I'm proud of my faculty, of my department, that it has taken that stance to, to, to include everyone and to make us all active participants. And um, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Uh, um, for a nihilist, I don't know where I get the hope from, but uh, we, we depend on God's grace at this point. But um, thank you for this conversation, and I hope that we can work further forward. Thank you for those insights, Dr. Mukwena, Dr. Dube, your closing remarks. Yeah, my closing remarks is just to say that um, uh, I am afraid that uh, this whole process will become just a passing phase. Uh, do we have, as some of the colleagues have alluded to, the 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 will the zeal the cognitive uh, map to continue with the discussion because the curriculum transformation is not only an event it is a process and and that process needs personnel it needs engagement it needs further uh, uh, further innovative ways of doing it and i've raised a question that if one of our stumbling block is the institutional culture, therefore, are we not just talking without tackling the bigger issues that we that we should be dealing with? Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Dr. Dube, for those insights and for those closing remarks. Dr. Samuel, your closing remarks, please. Thank you, Chairperson. I end up with uh, asking uh, the question which uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Mark Wigriff, asks of, that we ask of the institution the same thing that we ask of the curriculum in terms of who 
what and who is seen and heard in, well, in the institution and who is valued in terms of faculties, in terms of departments, in terms of the impact and the social responsiveness that we make in the university. And we should ask ourselves, are we, are we promoting a genuine commitment to curriculum transformation or are we just paying lip service to it if we don't address the uh, wider, broader aspects of institutional transformation? Thank you, Dr. Samuels, for those insights as well. Dr. Polmarans, your closing remarks, please. Well, as a closing remark, I can say that since we are in the midst of a, a, a global crisis of authority, right, and a global confusion of information, whether we look at the anti-vaccine debate and the uh, uh, riots and protests we've seen in South Africa just over a month ago, Right, may the University of Pretoria be a deliberative space of uh, where we respect the humanity of all, right, and where we uh, can come together in deliberative engagements with one another that will lead to an improvement in the quality of life and not just uh, a, a vacuous uh, 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 debates that will not make a difference to the actual quality of life of people. And therefore, I am a great supporter of our transformation drive at the university because our society needs strong universities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Olmarans, for those insights. Professor Van der Jaar, your closing remarks, please. Thank you, Professor Mamela. Um, I think Two things, leaders got to be firm in making decisions about difficult things, clear moral decisions between right and wrong. Uh, and for me, the three R's are restore, recognize, and respect human dignity. We are so busy focusing on appearance, the shell, that we forget to nurture the soul of a being. We need to create an inclusive institutional culture where all can feel a sense of belonging and feeling at home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Van der Jaar. Professor Passerman, your closing remarks, please. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Maimela. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm wondering how we can broaden this conversation. It's a Friday afternoon, and uh, I suspect it is staff members talking about curriculum transformation. So I think uh, the challenge probably is to how do we fully democratize this process and fully transform it to hear uh, other voices, specifically students' voices, both post and undergrad, and how do we accommodate them within these conversations, that it doesn't rem uh, remain a conversation on a Friday afternoon amongst academic staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues for all your insights this afternoon and also for your participation in this afternoon's lecture series. To all the participants, truly appreciated your uh, participation this afternoon and also to members of the audience at home, also thank you for joining us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, as a university, we are on a journey of rethinking, taking stock with regards to the topic of curriculum transformation and all the comments which are made in this fora as well in subsequent lecture series will be taken into account. Bearing in mind that as a university from 2022 will be under the microscope of the CHE as we do the review. And one of the fundamental aspects is the issue of curriculum transformation. So we, need to, we are striving and we are indeed making progress with regards to this topic of curriculum transformation. We look forward to seeing you more in this lecture series and also please look out for the, 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 the curriculum transformation uh, Facebook um, um, page as well as tweets with regards to this broad topic to ensure that we have a wider reach and it doesn't remain as a conversation between academics, but also all the stakeholders in the university are also participating. So ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, students, please stay safe and keep well. We're still living under very difficult conditions of COVID-19. From my side and the team is please keep well and enjoy the rest of your day as well as the weekend ahead. From my side, bye for now.